Ultimately, if you analyze your life, I, I, I keep coming to this conclusion over and over again as I watch um, human behavior. Ultimately, if you think about it, every single thing that you do, you do for the purpose of changing how you feel. Hopefully to feel better somehow. Every single thing you do. I can't think of a thing that doesn't fall into that. Can you, buddy? I mean, think about it. You buy a new car so you will get around better or whatever, but ultimately you buy the kind of car that you buy because you want to feel a certain way. You be with people because you want to feel a certain way. You mm, eat food because you want to feel a certain way. Many times we eat food just for the purpose of feeling a certain way. Yes? I mean, does that sound accurate? And so, we spend our lives going after things to help us feel this or that way. And it seems to me that we have a choice about just feeling that way in the first place without the, um, having to go do or be or have anything to get there. And how is that? What is the way that we can feel any darn thing that we want? Okay. We think in ways that will create that feeling. Remember, never forget this. Your feelings are preceded by your thoughts. And so if you have, if you're ever feeling <sighs> yuck in any way, and you have based on that formula, the right to the resulting thought, the resulting feelings. You don't have to go out and do or be or have anything to create that feeling that you want. I, we had some people in our, uh, up in our neighborhood who, um, there was a young lady who um, killed herself last weekend. Um, my son knows her, knew her, and, and then I had another friend who, childhood friend, who about uh, three weeks ago killed himself. You know, and they said, well, what, what was wrong with him? And what was wrong with her? We asked, asked my parents, because I didn't know anything about this until recently, and then this girl who killed herself over the weekend um, asked my, my son, do you know how, do you know her, what was going on? And it all boiled down to, for both of them, they felt yucky and they thought that shooting themselves, themselves would help make them feel better. I mean, that's clear at one end of the spectrum of trying to help myself out kind of idea, but you go all the way across the spectrum of, of behaviors that we do. You know, you're, you're in school right now so that you will get a degree, so that you will get a job, so ultimately you will feel successful or whatever. Now, when I was, does that make sense to anyone? I mean, everyone? Do, do you follow that line of reasoning? Um, when I was uh, going to school, I came upon, uh, and I, I don't hear very much out of this group anymore, but there was a group from Harvard called the Harvard, called the Harvard Mind Body Wellness Clinic, Har Harvard Mind Body Cancer Clinic. And a lot of the people who, some of the people who were involved in the early um, research on meditation, Herbert Benson being one of them, was involved right in the middle of this Harvard Mind Body Cancer Clinic. And they would work with people who were, um, you know, terminally ill with cancer. And um, they, 
understood that there is a mind-body connection going on. That there is a mind-body, there's, there's an interconnectedness between our thoughts, feelings, and attitudes and our physiology. And there's a whole field of, of um, research that's going on right now. Still the bully zone. We're buddies, not bullies. Okay. They, they call this field psychoneuro, it's a long word, immunology or PNI. Psycho meaning mind, neuro, nervous system, immune, somebody besides her. Immune system, and then the study of, right? So, we've got the study of how the mind, um, attitudes, thoughts, feelings affect the immune system. There's just a, I wanted to relate to you a couple studies that are really fascinating that they have, uh, amongst the monster amounts of research to show that how you feel and how you think affect how you are physically. The first study that came to mind was, or I thought was really interesting, they did one study with rabbits. And initially this study, and I think it was done at Ohio State, that's where they did this one, um, where they had uh, all these rabbits were part of a cholesterol study. It had nothing to do with what they intended for it to be or what it turned out to be, but it intended to be initially a study that was going to look at cholesterol levels among rabbits. And they gave all of these rabbits in this group um, a certain diet. And they wanted to see how they were, metabol they were, how they were developing cholesterol. And so they, they fed all these these rabbits were all in cages in this one particular place and they, um, the, the attendant there, the assistant, would give them all their food and stuff and then, then they killed them and then they opened them up and they checked their blood vessels for cholesterol levels. Well, what was interesting about this is there was one group of rabbits amongst the, the same group, there was one group of rabbits that fared differently. They had less cholesterol, less, um, fewer heart problems. Um, they were faring a lot better. And it shouldn't have happened because um, everyone in this group was given the same meal. They were given the same, they were all in the same um, cages. You know, they were all, essentially everything was the same. And they, so they went through, and there was one group that, of these multiple bunch of rabbits that was faring differently for heart health. They thought, what in the world's going on here? How could this happen? Because it shouldn't have happened. So they did it again. And sure enough, there was one set of rabbits that fared differently for heart health than all the other rabbits. They thought, what is going on here? We're feeding, we're doing everything the same. And they, the researchers asked the assistant, well, is there anything you do differently for this group of rabbits? And they, she said, well, I really like rabbits. So these ones that are about at arm's level, I'll take them out and I just cuddle them. <laughs> I, I like to pet them and caress them and, and, and that. And, but that's the only difference. And so they ran another study where they had rabbits who got, they called it in this study, well, they called it a different study uh, that I'll tell you about, kinesthetic tactile stimulation. <laughs> kinesthetic tactile sti stimulation, like meaning touching. touching, loving them. Um, and sure enough, the rabbits that got the kinesthetic ta tactile stimulation fared better than the ones who didn't. They did another study with preemies, we know what a preemie is, right? Um, 
babies born prematurely, and they had them in their little incubator places. Are we talking about humans? Yeah, these, the, in this case it was humans. Um, and so they had these, they had two sets, all of them randomly assigned to either the control group or the experimental group. They were all kind of in the same, mm, what, what, same ward in this hospital, but they were all kind of in the same um, state as far as their premature uh, level. They were all in fine shape. They were just born prematurely. And <coughs> so what they did is for 15 minutes a day, they would have come, somebody come in and pick up this group of preemies. The control group didn't get any of this, but they would pick up and cuddle the preemie for 15 minutes a day. Okay, everyone, every one of the preemies in this group, yes, this group didn't get any of the kinesthetic tactile stimulation, love. Um, and amongst the many different things that they looked at, they found that these preemies who got the touch, who got the love, grew 50% more weight per day than this group. There is research to show that more people die, those of you who are in the stress class, um, in the face-to-face -face class, remember this, more people die on Monday morning at 9 o'clock than any other time of the week. What's going on at Monday morning at 9 o'clock that's different than any other time of the week? Sports centers over, uh, sports talk shows over. Dang, they're still not playing NBA basketball. Wait, no, they are. Um, Family goes to work. Yeah, you go to work, and most people hate their jobs. There is another day of the year that more people die on than any other day of the year, and it's not April 15th. That's the one that's my least favorite day of the year. <laughs> no. New Year's Day. Mm, close and close. Day after, day after Christmas. The day after Christmas, there are more deaths in this country than any other day. I was just going to say, when I worked at the mortuary, New Year's Day, that week was really bad. That was a big day. But New Year's Day was like two days. You'd see more on that day yeah. when you were there? One mortuary, mm -hmm. so I don't know what other stuff. But you're in that same vicinity <laughs> of time. What's going on? that period of time what that's that's different than every other week of the year you got to face your next year okay family's going home christmas is over so all the anticipation of what you wanted maybe didn't get realized buddy Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. There, there was one study. I went to a conference, the National Wellness Conference, a few years ago, and there's this guy who's talking about heart disease. And he said, "So when you think of heart disease, and you think of what are the risk factors?" for heart disease? What are the common ones that come to mind when you think, oh, you've got to be careful about, blah, fill in the blank. What, what comes to mind as the common um, risk factors that m most of us in America recognize are risk factors for heart disease? So, okay, diet, exercise, what's cholesterol, stress, some, what? Being a male, you are higher risk if you're a male. How old you are? What? Minorities. Yeah, a little. It's not like African Americans are a higher risk mm -hmm. than um, other Americans. Um, what's? How do you tell? Okay, this is this is off from that, but how do you tell? What is the greatest predictor for? Um, how long you will live. Do you know? This is an interesting something. Do you remember that? Doesn't it have to do with your grandparents? 
Yeah, how old your grandparents were. Well, how, how old you are for heart disease, as you age, you get your risk increases. Just that's the way it is. Um, but here's the thing that this guy mentioned in this, in this presentation he was giving at the National Wellness Conference. He said, of those, so of those common risk factors, you know, the, the smoking, high cholesterol, poor diet, overweight, diabetes, all of these different risk factors, 50%, 50% of the people who have heart disease have none of those risk factors. Did you get that? 50% of the people who, and we, so we have 1,700 people dying every day of heart disease in America. 1,700 people are dying today, will die today from heart disease. 50% of them have none of the classic risk factors. Why are they called classic risk factors? Because that's what m medicine has decided are, through studies and research, okay, we know that smoking leads to that. We know that high cholesterol, well, we don't know about that anymore, but we know that um, obesity leads to it. And there's enough evidence to show that they do, classic risk factors. But what's going on with the other half? Yes. What? It's hereditary. No, nope, hereditary is part of this. That's one of these. No, they're, they're saying that there's, there's enough evidence to show that there is a enormous emotional, mental component that plays into heart disease. Enormous that's just starting to get, you know, when people say they died of a broken heart. Well, there's, there's a real connection there. Oh, it's hit the DSM-4 now. It's one of those. It's an actual disease they've diagnosed. Um, and, and that tells us that at it sounds like then, if that's the case, that they're recognizing that the emotions that this plays a, is playing a part in our well-being. So, I thought it would be fun and interesting if, so that's kind of, here's the negative side um, of this picture. What would be the, like, optimum mind-body wellness or mental, emotional, ways of being. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just kind of get to three or four of you in a group. And I'd like you to have one. So just really quickly, just turn so there's three or four of you in a group. Okay. Now, on your piece of paper, are we good? Has everyone got a grouped up? Okay, on your, on your piece of paper, I would like you to write peak emotional Wellness. Okay. Peak emotional wellness. If we're interested in how we feel, that's kind of the, the end game for everything we do. And we have some idea of what that might feel like, what that might, you know, joy, love, passion, whatever that is. We have some idea of what that might be like. The question is, what are some things that we can do that will help us achieve this? In other words, in our day-to-day -day activities, and, and I want you to avoid the obvious. Manage stress, exercise, eat well, get enough sleep, get out in the sun. You know, those are the obvious ones. I want you to avoid those. Because we all know that. We've, we've hit that. But what other things, what other ways of thinking, what other ways... And, and so I'll, I'll throw out one or two just to get you thinking. Things like service. Or things like forgiveness. Um, those kind of things. What other behaviors or attitudes... And that's two different things can you incorporate or can you see would lead toward 
the, the end game of feeling really good. What do we know that seems to work to get us there? Okay? So just take, we're going to take three or four minutes, two or three minutes, and just kind of bullet really fast, kind of brainstorm, no wrong answers, and see what you come up with. And try to get everyone um, thinking involved in this game. So go ahead and talk. So what I'd like to do is just kind of round robin this and, and uh, we'll see what you came up with. And then when, after this, we're going to explore what did, how does our list compared with what those guys at the Harvard Mind-Body Clinic um, felt like were these top things that um, tend to lead toward peak mind-body wellness. So what I would like to do is just tell me, I'll go to each group and just tell me one thing that you have and then we'll discuss it so that we all understand um, what, what you're trying to describe and then we'll do the same with everyone else. So just give me one thing that you guys wrote down. Sharing talents? And in what way does that, why, why did that come up? service, I think, but if you're giving of yourself like something that you do really well, it usually makes you feel good. So like, say you can play the piano really excellently, so you go and play the piano at an assistant building seminar, like that, or you're really good with special needs kids, so you volunteer at a school, or... Okay. Are you using your talents to be rewarding because it's something you are good at, so you feel like you're good at it? But usually when you share talents, it's also doing a service. Okay. Excellent. Excellent example. Okay. One thing that you... Um, probably smiling. Smile. <laughs> so you just fake it until you're... <laughs> your, your muscles have given your brain the right message. No, there is something to that, that uh, you're, you're, yeah, that's true. I always remember, I grew up with Lavelle Edwards, his sons were my friends, and that guy looked like the most grumpy guy. You, everyone knows Lavelle Edwards, former football coach at BYU, his, mind, his face like this, <laughs> all the time. He was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. He, he wasn't grumpy, but his, that just reminded me of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one, one thing that you have. Being grateful. Grateful. Okay, now let's, we've, we've played with that quite a bit. Uh, why did you put that on your list? Because I think um, just appreciating small things. In what way? It adds up in what way? Instead of, you know, focusing on maybe things you don't have, appreciating the small things that you do have can make you positive. Can make you positive. So, so gratitude helps you be more... Positive. Does it? I think it's also kind of part of the service thing, too. Showing other people appreciation mm -hmm. makes them feel better, so you're giving them yourself. Uh -huh. The other day I said thank you to no man because he acted like he'd never before been thanked in his life and he was so excited. You made his day. His day, you really did. Nice job. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See how easy it is to make people's day? Yeah, it was. He was so happy. I think that being grateful too is the root of all of those positive feelings, whether it's being honest or um, optimistic. If you can have a, a level of gratitude about all of those things, you're oh, more open-minded to the other stuff. Yeah, if you guys remember the stress management class uh, and on my levels of responding table, I'm convinced that's the highest attitude we can have. I found few things that are, that's the highest way of responding to things, not the highest attitude, but the most powerful way of responding to something we can't control is by being grateful for our, for our well-being and our, our happiness. It just seems to work every time it's tried, buddy. Yeah, if you split the word up, it's just great attitude merged into one. Mm -hmm. The great attitude, yep. I like that. Gratitude, the great attitude. Okay, beautiful. 
What uh, something more? What else? Um, one thing: taking time for yourself, doing the things that you know that you enjoy. So. Have you ever um, known people who, when you ask them, you know, what they love to do, and then ask them after they answer, how long has it been since you've done that? Some of them are hard pressed to remember the last time they did the things they most love to do. Does that make any sense to you? That you're living a life not doing the things that you most love to do. Well, seems like that's why we're here. Sort of. Sometimes you ask them that and they don't even know what they, right. love, what they love to do. Hard pressed to find an ant. What do I love to do? Nothing comes to mind because they're so busy doing. Yeah. I think that's an excellent, excellent example or excellent comment. Okay, what other things did you put? Are, were you in the same group? Oh. Okay. Wait, I have one though. Oh, okay. Then throw it out here. I think both of me laughing and like helping you are important. Laughter. Um, there was, you've all heard of the guy, was it Norman Cousins? Have you heard of Norman Cousins' story? Um, he was diagnosed with a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. That was the disease he was diagnosed with. I don't know why I remember that. He was diagnosed with, and they said, essentially, he was a, he was a professor. I think he was at UCLA or some Southern California school. And they said, you have only this long to live. And he said, fine. I'm going to have the blast, the, the most blast of a time these last few months to live. And so he did. He, he went and he bought or he watched Laurel and Hardy slapstick kind of comedies. And he loved, this was back when MASH, I know it's long before your time, but MASH was a, a going TV show. And he just, all he did was he watched those and he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And time came for when he was supposed to die. He didn't. He kept on living. He went on tour. He wrote a book. I think he's passed on now, but um, he went on tour promoting the idea that we have to be laughing. We have to be, there's something very, very healthy for our immune system for laughter. Our immune systems love laughter. <coughs> and they crank. Just like when the opposite is the case, there's, there's really interesting studies on how stress affects the immune system. Um, there was one study that, that, that I remember that came to mind just now, um, where they took, you can test immune functioning by salivary cortisol. Uh, we actually did a study with those here, with that here. Um, <coughs> So, in other words, if you've got salivary cortisol going, that means your stress levels are high. Cortisol is one of the two um, stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, right? So, they tested um, these, they had uh, medical students who were in their first year of their medical uh, work and they tested their immune system at the beginning of the semester and then they begin, oh, they, they also, you can test um, for immune functioning in your saliva as well and you can test in your blood. Um, so they tested them for stress levels and immune functioning at the beginning of the semester and then again um, right before one of their hairiest tests. And they found that when their stress levels went up and immune function went down. It was almost a direct relationship, a one-to-one -one relationship. The more stress they have, the more, the less well their immune function is, is going. 
And some of us have really probably experienced this ourselves. We get to the end of a really tough semester and we just fight it and fight it and we just go, and then after the semester's over, we're just sick. Have any of you ever had that happen? Where you're, you just, okay, that's, I can't handle it anymore, and you just, three or four days, you're just knocked out. Well, stress does it. Stress and the immune system are not buddies. They, they like to go the opposite way. So, um, and laughter, when you're laughing about things, and a lot of these things, when you're doing these kinds of things, the immune system gets the message, wow, we love that. If, you, if you're really stressed, one of the best things you can do is go on a roller coaster ride, one that you love. That feeling of exhilaration, you actually have mm, chemistry that when you're in doing something you love to do, your chemistry goes, wow, this is great. And your m immune system goes, oh, we like this, okay, shunk. And it cranks. Quickly, um, my mom passed away years ago from a really rare brain disorder disease. And in the end, uh, she couldn't speak, function, she couldn't communicate. And it took away everything. And we put on a, uh, it was so cool because we put on a Carol Burnett, Dean Martin, old shows, and she laughed and laughed and laughed. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool. That's a powerful, it's a powerful emotion. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way. Um, it was just a beautiful way to communicate and know that she was still getting it. Yeah. You know, I could see it. Hmm. So let me, let me. Nice. Yeah. Really powerful. We're, we're just starting to understand how connected all of our parts are. The immune system, our emotions, mm -hmm. and the, the positive or negative effect it's having on us. 